And I actually had a, a conversation with a, a youth group uh, on the primary schools. I was like, when you think of a mangrove swamp, what do you think of? It smells bad, somewhere to put your rubbish, oh breeds my God, mosquitoes. To put your rubbish. Yeah, none of them were over 10. I can't be angry at them. Yeah. They're just going based on what they've seen and heard, right? Mm-hmm. Hello, podcast fans. Welcome back to another week of Grassroots Radio. I'm your host, Janet Bird, and this week we are bringing you our third and final piece of our series on sustainable development featuring marine ecologist Julio Camacho. And I think I'm actually going to miss this series because it's been so educational for me speaking about this topic with so many different experts in very different areas, but kind of finding the common thread being a really strong need to take care of the resources that we have because they are indeed finite and we need to do this by thinking long term instead of what's going to be good for us right now in the short run. As much as I have enjoyed discussing this topic with our expert guests, we do have lots more in store. For instance, next up we will have our technology series where we'll be speaking with local entrepreneurs in the tech industry. And then we'll also be taking a look at Antigua's very new and very growing cannabis industry. So stay tuned for that later on in season two of Grassroots Radio. This week's focus is, of course, on our oceans, our seas, and all the different life forms that live within and around them. So we're talking coral reefs, we're talking seagrass beds, and we're talking mangrove swamps. These are all ecological features that we sometimes take for granted or even treat as inconveniences when we're thinking about what we would like an area to be like under ideal human situations. However, as Rulia was going to explain, each of these features plays a very important role in maintaining the health of our overall natural environment. And so, without further ado, here's Rulia Camacho to tell you who he is, what he does, and why it is all so important. My name is Rulia Kamako. I am 29 years old. I'm from the island of Antigua and Barbuda. Grew up and lived in Falmouth. I am a marine scientist, specifically a marine ecologist by training. So I have a dual master's degree in marine biology and marine policy from the University of Maine. I previously worked at the Environmental Awareness Group, Department of Environment, and currently I work at National Parks Authority. And this field of work is something that you've been interested in for a very long time. I think when I first met you as a teenager, you were already saying that you were going to study marine biology. So can you tell me what originally sparked that interest in you? Right. So I actually consider myself to be one of the lucky ones. Um, Growing up, I never really had the the question of what it is I wanted to do. And, and it was really simple. I grew up around the sea. I had a, my father always took me fishing, sailing, diving, you know, got me introduced to that mm-hmm. stuff. So I, I was a sea baby, basically. And then I realized I liked science. Um, I liked the idea of doing something to see what happens, which is basically what science is. And, and observing things to understand them better. And I, I especially like nature. And so, you know, the way you combine nature and your love of science with your love of the ocean is marine science. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was really a natural thing to me. You know, of course, growing up, everybody's oh, you know, go be a doctor, go be a lawyer, go be this. You won't make any money in science. But at the end of the day, it's just where my passion is. Um, And as growing older, I kind of made up my mind that this is what I wanted to do. So I kind of fashioned my Um, school life and career life all in the effort to get me closer and closer to that quote-unquote ultimate goal of being a you know core ecologist in marine science and a marine scientist in Antigua and Barbuda. And here you are. It's 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 been a journey but it's a good journey so far. (laughs) It's not done. All right so for you know our younger audience members who may not be super familiar with what marine ecology is can you tell us what maybe a typical day or a typical week in your work life looks like? Okay so 
I'll, I'll give an explanation first and then answer that question. So mm -hmm. um, basically, biology is the study of living things, right? Um, when you get into higher levels of biology, though, um, biology really refers to the, the inner study of living things. So how does a human body operate or how does a fish move? What are the inner reactions that occur that allow it? So that's what your typical marine biologist does. Ecology looks at the ecosystem from a, a further perspective and trying to understand the interactions between different organisms within this ecosystem and how it leads to the functioning of the ecosystem. So I'm, I, I've learned that I preferred ecology, which is given a broader understanding still very detailed right mm -hmm. but it, it is a broader understanding of how does this fish interact with this fish interact with this coral interact with this algae interact with this phytoplankton interact with this chemical and this temperature and understanding how all of that comes together to affect the ecosystem um, and that's what ecology so that's really what i look at the, the marine ecology of things rather than saying to you oh well this coral has exactly this kind of chemical within it which causes it to emit this photoradiance etc etc that's more mm -hmm. marine biology um and in a typical week in an ideal world if i work my ideal job um, it involves diving, so I do either scuba diving or snorkeling where I am checking a marine ecosystem. You know, it could be uh, the sandy habitats along a beach system, it could be the seagrass beds, it could be a coral reef. Um, there's also the, the intermediate ecosystems or the, the ecosystem that transitions between the land and the sea. So this is mangrove wetlands. Um, so, you know, a week may also involve me going into a mangrove wetland, um, you know, if there's an issue or just trying to better understand its extent, the health characteristics, etc. So we can better monitor it. Um, as much as I don't like writing, um, there's always a bunch of writing associated with science because you have to put your information out. So um, typical week also involves me maybe writing a report. Um, giving information to maybe a media team so they can put information out. I try and do maybe an EAG talk article to try and get information out to the public. I have tried to better myself at public speaking because scientists aren't the best communicators and we've often been accused and very rightly so of speaking science without actually speaking in a way that the average person will understand. So I've tried to improve my ability to communicate what I know and find exciting to persons who may not care that much about science um, and may not understand why it's so important that you do this and not this. Mm -hmm. um, so it's so a lot of it is me collecting information um, to generate a report or to try and improve the management. Um, a lot of it is monitoring, a lot of it is data analysis and uh, some communication mixed in between. But the good thing is for me, Collecting information means I get to go in the ocean, so I can't really complain too much about that. <laughs> it sounds like a pretty fun job, except for those parts that you're not so big on. Well, so, so like I said, it's it's an ideal world. That's what it'd be. Mostly, <laughs> well, with the new with the position I'm in, no. So I did a job switch from Department of Environment um, as of the end of November to National Parks. So Department of Environment, I was a natural resource officer, which meant I did do some marine stuff, but I had a whole lot of other stuff going on also um, from a terrestrial perspective. Whereas at National Parks, I am the marine ecologist at National Parks. So 60% um, of my work or what's not has to do with marine life. Um, I'm being put in charge of improving the management of the marine areas, um, trying to better understand the health of our ecosystems, why they're in the health that they're in, understand what we can do to better protect them in light of climate change and human development and all these other factors. So I do get to go out into the ocean a bit more than I used to. So you mentioned that communicating is also a big part of your job, and especially in this, you know, the time that we're living in where climate change is one of the big global issues, it's becoming even more important to communicate to the public, which isn't always something that scientists are good at doing. Uh, can you tell me about some of your efforts around, you know, educating the public and what are some of the things that you think are the most important to communicate to the Antiguan public in particular? I'll put it this way. What I've tried to do is I've tried to find as much mediums as I can that already exists 
to put my message into. So I've given talks at groups like Rotaract. Um, I've given talks to schools, whether it be primary schools or secondary schools. Um, there's been several times when I've, I've actually given a full science talk once, which, well, not once, more than once, but there's one at the EAG, which they were putting on a science seminar series, uh, which I've given a talk, I've given talks at State College. Um, I also, I get called from either radio or TV network. So whether it's be ABS, observers, ZDK, you know, um, if there's a particular pressing environmental issue ongoing and they wanted someone to kind of explain it a bit more. Um, I, I think I'm on the list for most of them right now as someone who can speak about marine issues and marine aspects. Um, so, and often I've had them reach out to me and be like, hey, is there something that you want to talk about? What we also, what I've also tried to do is, so you have like World Wetlands Day is coming up on February 2nd. And so I'm supposed to be trying to arrange to do a school tour with a primary school to, to a wetland so I can explain to them the importance and the different types and try and, you know, delete some of the misconceptions, et cetera. Um, so you try and think about what global events are happening. Um, is it International Day of the Reef or International Shark Day, you know, whatever it is. And you try and piggyback on those avenues. Um, that is, that is some of the main ways I've tried to do it. Um, the other thing I've tried to do is the EAG article. So EAG has a talk article every Thursday in the newspaper where they, you know, have a science discussion, basically. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to put out different articles in that column, you know, when I have the time and motivation to write something, um, which I will confess, I probably don't do nearly as much as I should. But, you know, try and put out stuff in that medium so persons can have a read. I've created a marine ecology page, marine ecology 268 page on Instagram, where I try and also put out, you know, like cool pictures that I take and what I, you know, what I think are fancy information. Now, again, I'm a scientist, so what I think is fancy may not be <laughs> what somebody else <laughs> thinks is fancy. But I've had, I've had mixed feedback. I've had some persons be like, eh, okay. And some persons be like, oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Right. And, and what I try and do a lot is not only talk about the, the post of species. So by post of species, I mean, you have for the Caribbean, you'd have turtles, you'd have dolphins, and you'd have whales, and maybe eagle rays or manta rays, you know, one of those, mm -hmm. which are what, you know, the things that people get quote unquote excited for. Right. Um, and I've tried to take that excitement and try and talk about stuff like coral polyps and jellyfish and um, maybe a different type of algae and maybe particular fish species or urchin or starfish or, you know, something like that, Try, trying to get persons to understand that, you know, our oceans are more than just what we see on a regular. Mm -hmm. And many times what we see on a regular are doing pretty well because they have that much attention and right. our attention is actually needed and some of the other things. And again, because I'm an ecologist, the more I can get you to understand about the whole system, the better I know you'll be able to manage it in a, in a more environmentally friendly way. So let's talk about the reefs a bit because Antigua in particular is a coral island. We always hear that, mm -hmm. uh, which means it's made from coral. And yet the reefs and how you take care of them is not something I think is generally well understood. So I guess first, could you start by describing what exactly is coral, that stuff that sometimes you see wash up on the shore. It's really porous and stuff. What is it actually? And like, what does it do? What is the function of it in the ecological system? So coral is neither animal nor plant, but it's actually both. And this is getting into biology. But so a coral is actually an animal. What, what we call a coral is actually a coral polyp, which the best way to think about it is a really, really small jellyfish that is upside down. Hmm. That is, if you think about that, we think that the tentacles weren't really tentacles, but it had a bunch of fingers that were like tentacles. Um, so you have this coral polyp, and the coral polyp is translucent. And a byproduct of the coral polyp as it grows, it secretes calcium carbonate, more commonly known as limestone, right? Hmm. So coral polyps, a, a coral, what you see as a coral is a colony of coral polyps living together. And the hard structure is the calcium carbonate slash or limestone that they've secreted. 
right? The color that you see in a coral polyp is due to what's called a phytoplankton. It's a, actually called zooxanthellae. And so it's a microscopic plant organism that actually lives within the tissue of the coral polyp itself, right? And the reason being is that, the, oh, the, you know, the Caribbean is known for its beautiful, clear, turquoise waters. That is our major selling point, you know? You don't, a Caribbean person doesn't go to New York and want to go and swim because the waters are dirty, right? No, sir. It's, it's we, want, we want the water that's my my aunt used to tell me that if she drops her false teeth, she can look in the water and pick it up without putting on a diving glass. That's, right. that's, that's the water quality that we want. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that water quality has very low nutrients. So corals mm -hmm. are like an oasis within a desert. If you think of low nutrients being um, a desert area, so all waters are low nutrient waters. Corals are like an oasis because with their combination with the zooxanthellae or the, the phytoplankton that's within the tissue, right? The corals filter the water and catch any little nutrients. And then the zooxanthellae, because they're plants, use the sunlight that's able to penetrate to them because the water is so clear and produce food. Right. And so it's a symbiotic relationship where basically the coral polyp is protecting the plant the plant species from being eaten by other, you know, zooxanthellae, which are anim microscopic animals. And the plant gives the coral polyp some of the food that it makes through photosynthesis because, you know, it gets so much sunlight that it makes extra food. And so you have the symbiotic relationship happening. So when you look at a coral, you have to understand that the hard thing is calcium carbonate that's been secreted. But if you look really carefully, you can often see the little, it's very, very small polyps and the colors that you're seeing is because of the plant aspect of it. Um, so, so that's really what you're seeing when you look at a coral reef. So these little polyps are actually what built our island. Yes. And so I'm glad you mentioned that. So the, we have said that Antigua is a coral island. Really, actually, Antigua is like a third coral. Mm -hmm. And it, the rest is volcanic. Bab, yeah. It's, 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 it's a, there's, a, there's actually a map about it. But Barbuda is actually almost 90% coral, um, which is why. And, and you see... One of the reasons, one of the ways you can tell that is because of the many cave systems in Barbuda. Mm -hmm. um, because as you said, coral is very porous and limestone isn't the hardest thing in the world. It's just pretty solid, but it can dissolve, right? And so mm -hmm. you get a lot of cave formations. And if you do a course for Barbuda, you can actually date back and tell the species of coral and um, from because it's calcium carbonate, it has in carbon, so you can carbon date it and really determine mm -hmm. when it was made. Um, so you can actually do a lot of cool work with it. Really cool. Which would be like a coral geology person, <laughs> not so much a coral <laughs> ecologist person. So it, it, no, there's really a ton of different aspects that you can look at it from. Yeah, it's really fascinating stuff. So can you tell me a bit about this community reef management project that you were running in the Falmouth community? and also the paper that came out of that. Okay, so as part of my master's work, um, I've always had the view that you really want to, I didn't want to go away and study something abstract because I always wanted to come back and work in Antigua, um, primarily because I realized that there was a gap. There's a gap in terms of the knowledge being generated. And very often what is happening in Antigua is that you have knowledge being generated other places of the world and then we use it for management mm -hmm. and the best way to manage something is really by knowing what you have and yes we're even a caribbean ecosystem if you think of it from a caribbean level for there's sure. minute differences between so it's it's like if somebody makes a generalization of antigua and say oh the whole antigua is dry um well no some parts are dry some parts are mm -hmm. rainy like if you go in the rainforest some parts are this some parts are that right in the yep. same way you know there's, there's very minute there's very differences there's a lot of differences between the region so i really wanted to do something that could be, a be done in antigua and b kind of help to jumpstart my career in antigua so what i looked at was um a combination of ecology and management where i wanted to a understand how um, herbivory herbivory is just a, the process of consuming plant organisms on a reef and so by plant organisms here, I'm not actually referring to the zooxanthellae. Um, I'm referring to algae and other species, right? 
uh, which were one of the main competitors, the Corys. And so I wanted to know how the process of herbivory um, is in the, like, how fast it's happening, what is causing it to happen, why has it decreased, why have we had more algae, how is that being affected by management? And from the policy perspective, I wanted to understand if a different form of management could work in into you. Because many times you have this top-down system where you have, you're, you're a developing island, there's only so many resources. Um, we set these rules, but we don't have the personnel, the manpower, the capacity, nor the financial ability to manage them in the way that, say, the U.S. would manage a protected area. Right. So, you know, they have lots of money, they can buy the boats, they have the vessels, they have people patrolling it 24-7. Even if you don't want to listen to the rules, you're forced to listen to the rules. Mm -hmm. Many times in Antigua, you have these declared areas, but you really don't have the ability to manage them in the way of a top-down system. So what I wanted to understand was, whether or not we could copy a model that was being that had been used in areas where you've traditionally had tribal systems. So it's community-based management where a community will say, hey, we're setting these rules for this ecosystem and we're going to manage it because we've come together under a group and decide to do X. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you really don't need governmental support because if you have full buy-in, from the community members. And so instead of having two or three persons keeping an eye on it, you have everybody in the community keeping an eye on it. And everybody is making sure everybody else is doing the right thing, right? right? So mm -hmm. it very much reduces the price of management, but often improves the results of management, right? But it mm -hmm. does need buy-in. So what I want, I, I did a pilot where I asked fishermen in the Falmouth and English Java area to not fish a pretty small area to be honest to be honest with you but I asked them to not fish an area for a two-year period where there wasn't any legal stipulation that they couldn't do it um, I had no way of monitoring whether or not they were going to do it um, but I was asking them as to do it as part of the experiment that I was conducting to see whether or not if their efforts could result in an ecological change in the reef ecosystem how did you so go about choosing the area that would not be fished? So I did it. Um, it was kind of chosen based on, I did some surveys. Um, so mm -hmm. I had three areas that I surveyed. Um, two that were going to be used as the control areas. So areas where I didn't tell them to change the fishing practices. And one that was going to be the conservation area. Um, it had to be kind of between Falmouth and English Harbor. And it had to be near enough that persons could see it. So it's not direct monitoring, but you can't have it behind someone back because you really have no way of confirming. So right. what I would do when I was in Antigua, I would just go and count whether or not I saw boats in the area, um, if there were fishing boats in the area. So mm -hmm. that, that would be like, you know, whether or not I'm seeing fishing activity. Right. Um, but yeah, that and also it was done within the... Nelson Dock and National Park area, and it was an area of interest for them also. So um, I suggested it based on the studies that are done, the fishermen agreed, and this, nothing was written. So these fishermen didn't even have a common cooperation. So this was me talking to different people at different time. So you just went to individuals and told right, them. Right, because I, I tried to have a meeting, a community meeting, and three persons showed up. I gave my talk, explained what it was. They said it was a good idea, but they said that you need to go and talk to more people. So then I started walking around and talking to people. Uh, and, and this, you know, what it kind of highlights is the potential issues with this community system. So in the Indo-Pacific region, there was a study which, which they did something similar, right? They were trying mm -hmm. to set up a community-based group. And my professor at the time, he was one of the persons behind it. He said he went to this community meeting uh, he said uh, more than half the community turned out. And he said there were like four or five elders at the back of the room. And he said he gave the talk and people asked questions and yada, yada, yada. And the talk was over and he was about to leave. And someone came up to him and said, hey, the elders want to speak to you. Oh my. And he went and had a meeting with the four elders. And they mm -hmm. said, you know what? We think this is a good idea. We're going to do this. And that was the end of the discussion everybody in the community listened to the elders and the right. elders said we're doing this and so it was boom they are the no decision issue. makers they are the decision makers mm -hmm. we don't have that kind of system in the caribbean no 
Um, so it's a lot harder to set up this community management system because, you know, even if a politician was to say you're not going to do something, you're still not going to be, you get 50% of the people maybe yeah. listening and the other 50% won't. So it, you kind of have to get buy-in. You have to have to do a lot more work to get the buy-in from the stakeholders. But right. it was fairly successful. Um, I saw statistical scientific changes. So that's the beauty of science. Eh? You, oh, wow. you don't and that was over how much time? Two, two years. So two years. it was from... I got it established in 2014 and I did my last set of measurements in 2016 on it. Um, and weirdly, I did have reports. Fishermen came to me and said, hey, you know, we saw this boat in the area, which was very interesting because I actually <laughs> never asked them to do that. But that was never one of my requirements. <laughs> you're right. into it, right. Right. So, so they'd come to me and say, hey, this area they told us not to go to. You know, we, we see this person in there. We, we don't have the right to tell the person to move, but I'm letting you know that we saw someone mm-hmm. in it. Um, which to me was a very positive thing. It showed the potential to expand it, but it also highlighted because of how difficult it was for me to get to talk to persons and how small of an area. If you're to really try to build it up, you need at very least like a fisherman's cooperation or something yeah. where they could come together as a group. I could present to them. They make a decision. I present the science, you know, provide the science to them and they do the management. But unless you have like a group like that this willing to agree with one another and fishermen can be very interesting individuals so <laughs> you know something works today and the minute one person decides hey we're not gonna do this that can be the collapse of the whole system right now yeah it's kind of the broken window syndrome right as soon as there's a problem somewhere and people can see it and that nobody's kind of taking care of it then it's like well we can do it too yeah 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 so um but it was it was it was like any good science experiment, you should raise more questions than you had at the beginning. Yeah. And that is essentially what it is. It was successful. I had a paper published off of it, which was my first published paper, um, and did a talk about it. And, you know, it, it's kind of led me to do some other work, which is it's actually helping to guide some of my decisions in my current work, which I'm trying to devise like zoning management for the Nelson Dockyard National Park area. But, you know, it... It was successful, like, from a scientific perspective. From a policy perspective, it raised a lot more questions about what needed to be done um, to get a system like this to work. And what it actually led me to understand was that community-based management, it sounds very good, but I'm not sure we have the structure in Andiga and Barbados to do something like that. What we'd probably work a little bit better with is a co-management system where you still have the community group, you have the governmental group, and they cooperate together to manage the system. So whether it's the government will put in the funds to demarcate it and the fishermen help to monitor it or, you know, whatever agreement they come right. to. Um, so it's not just depend, and there's some legality behind of it, mm-hmm. but it is still a decision of the community, um, which is a little bit harder to, to, to get done, but it, it has shown to be effective in, in some areas. Mm-hmm. So what are some of the challenges that you would come up against trying to inf- like get more stronger policies in place? Because I know that there are things already, like we do have conservation areas, we do have national park areas, um, there's a fisheries act, there's all these different laws on the books. Right. So what is really the challenge in either enforcing those or is it a matter of updating them or something? What do you think? It's a combination of both. Um, from the enforcing part, it really comes down to um, most of the departments who are responsible for environmental management and protection aren't really staffed and given the resources necessary for that reason. So, for instance, I worked at the DOE before. Um, they do a lot of terrestrial protection and what's not, but the unit within the DOE that's really looking at terrestrial management protection isn't necessarily the biggest part of the DOE's mandate, right? Fisheries does a lot of work looking at that, but fisheries also has to deal with um, fishery statistics and making sure customers are getting the right product and checking the markets and doing exports, and, and they really have a small staff allocation. Right? So to ask them to then say, hey, you have these four areas that need to be um, patrolled daily or something like that, that becomes an issue. So many times we have laws on the books that 
on paper are very good, but they're very hard to execute. Um, and I think part of our problem, which is why I've started to focus a little bit more on education, is that I find um, from an environmental perspective, we don't put enough emphasis into explaining the rationale behind of the laws. So for instance, one of my big pet projects right now is trying to get people to stop eating parrot fish. Um, it's, it's really one of the things that, that I'd love. If, if tomorrow I could wake up and everyone would stop eating parrotfish, it'd be amazing for our reef ecosystems. But, Why is that important? So it, it's a combination, right? Um, mm-hmm. Parrotfish are one of our primary herbivores. So if you, if you remember earlier, I mentioned that the main competitor to corals is algae. So algae is very similar to seaweed, um, but it's not seaweed because seaweed is actually a plant like a flowering plant that, you know, um, reproduces the same way the flowering plants that you see on the land reproduce. Algae doesn't have a full root system. It has what's called a whole fast. But they, they compete with corals for space. So mm-hmm. corals need open spaces to grow. Algae need open spaces to grow. So they compete with each other to try and get this open space. The problem is, Algae got the better end of the evolution stick. So they're faster growers. Mm -hmm. The fastest growing coral that we have grows 12 centimeters a year on a good day, on a good year, Mm -hmm. 12 centimeters. This, this, and that's a kind of branching coral and the slow growing ones, which are brain corals can grow as little as two to three centimeters a year. Oh my. So versus one of our slowest growing algaes, I think can put on 20 to 30 centimeters in a year. So it's really no comp. Yeah. when it comes to growth speed <clears throat> um additionally algae can actively poison adult corals in this competition wall wow. and they can re- prevent baby corals from being able to grow hmm. right they're very warlike yeah yeah <laughs> Al- algae algae don't make no sense yeah. they, they don't make no joke they, they when they invade they invade yeah, how aggressive. coral reefs ecosystem fight against algae because it's not that algae are bad but they're a necessary part of the ecosystem. It's just that they need to be controlled, mm-hmm. right? Because one of the things that algae do is algae pulls out a lot of the nutrients out the water. So if you have a pollution or something, you tend to have an algae growth. <clears throat> the reason you have an algae growth is it's pulling a lot of the nutrients out the water. So algae, algae aren't necessarily a bad thing. It's just the amount that becomes a bad thing. And where right? they are. Right. Um, and so how coral reefs fight against algae, how coral reef fight, ecosystem fights against algae is through the use of herbivores. So we have two main classes of herbivores in the Caribbean. We have the fish herbivores, which are your parrot fish and your doctor fish or surgeon fish. And you have your urchins, primarily um, the diadema, which is the black sea urchin. Um, the one with very long spines, um, very black in color, right? In the early 1980s, there's a disease that passed through the entire Caribbean region that wiped out over 90% of diadema everywhere. So it moved from where we had diadema densities of about um, 10 per meter squared to less than 0.1 per meter squared throughout the Caribbean region. Right? So that was, a, that was a Caribbean wipe out. That was, it, mm-hmm. it went around the Caribbean region in less than two years. And it actually happened so fast. And it was in 1980s, so technology and communication wasn't the best mm-hmm. that the labs around the Caribbean weren't really able to communicate and get the samples sent to the right places in time before the disease had done its work. Oh, it was that fast. Yeah. Right. So you have your, you have your, um, so the diademas have been lost. The populations are kind of starting to come back, but they aren't coming back as fast as we'd like them to. And then you have your parrotfish. Um, and, what I've realized is a lot of people don't realize there's like 10 or 11 different species of parrot fish that we have in our waters. Um, some of them naturally get bigger than some. Um, and you have your grazers and you have your scrapers. And so basically they feed differently, mm-hmm. right? So there's different types of algae. So different types of parrot, parrot fish feed on different types of algae. And the bigger parrot fish can feed on the bigger algae because they're able to deal with it better and the smaller ones tend to feed on the small algae it really is right. there's a whole system mm-hmm. and this is why ecology interests me so much right because it's, yeah. it's it's understanding this system of interaction between all these species and so what we have is 
in Antigua, I can speak for Antigua, definitely, we've had a culture of consuming part fish. And what I've learned to understand is part fish really became a local homestay because especially with the tourism market, the fishermen would sell the groupers and the snappers to the hotels because they take the high prices, right? Mm. So the part fish tend to be given to the locals right. because they can't sell them to the uh-huh. hotels, right? So you then get this person's growing up eating part fish over the years. It's just what they eat. The fishermen sell the groupers. And, you know, every so often you get a group and snap, it's yay. But normally you get part <laughs> fish, doctor fish, you know, Dr. the, the, fish, the yeah. fish that the hotel and the tourists of don't really want as much, right? Mm -hmm. so then you get a cultural aspect of eating it right and this has been going on for for years and this is not just like yesterday 10 years ago 20 years ago this has been years in the making yeah in that same way pirate fish are also very much favored by the older generation because they have a softer flesh so Mm -hmm. it's a little bit easier for them to consume it so we've had this history of fish and pirate fish and in the same time, we've been reducing herbivores from the part fish side. You then had a disease that wiped out the other set of herbivores, which are the diadema, right? So now yeah. you have a struggling part fish population. That diadema is still illegal. Um, you've had the impacts of hurricanes. And so the algae had a field day. Well, they had a field decades. Right. They, had a couple, they had a couple of field decades where they basically... They're basically what we term as a phase shift, where the reefs have gone from coral-dominated to algal-dominated systems. And this is not just Antigua. This is throughout the mm-hmm. most entire Caribbean region. Um, so my thing is I'd like persons to stop eating parrotfish because the diadema aren't recovering as, as fast as they could. We still have some parrotfish. So really and truly, the reefs need all the help you can. Right. right? We haven't invented a way we haven't invented a lawnmower that can work on coral reefs yet. Um, no. Because essentially, that's what you want. Essentially, you want a lawnmower and just go over the reef and just cut down all the algae and have the coral try and grow. But again, remember how slow the coral grows, yes. how fast the algae grows. And, you know, hurricanes have caused their damage. Um, I will never deny that. And I've actually had a lot of discussions with fishermen and older persons about they blame a lot of the loss of our reef systems, the hurricanes. Um, and the reason is hurricanes, we, we had, Antigua had a pretty bad hurricane period between 1989 and say 2001, mm-hmm. where we had almost a major storm every year. Like it started with Hugo in 89, we also had Lewis in 95, we had Lenny in 99, you know, we had all these major storms. Yeah. So there's a lot of physical degradation to the coral reef during that time. For sure. But a healthy ecosystem isn't doesn't get destroyed by physical degradation because it still has the factors to mitigate against the negative factors that occur after physical degradation. So when you have an adult coral that gets broken from a, from a hurricane, right? Mm-hmm. One of two things can happen. A, when it's on its side or wherever it is, if it's a healthy ecosystem and there's a lot of herbivores so the algae can't overgrow it and take advantage of its weakened state, it'll just grow. And it's one of the ways that coral reefs spread because you can break a coral reef and put them down in separate places, give them the right, right. conditions, and we'll each of them will grow. grow. Yeah. Right. So it doesn't stop. But when you have a weakened ecosystem, algae is able to dominate these broken systems. Right. And so and therefore you had, right. And so the recovery potential of coral reef ecosystem has been weakened tremendously because of the lack of herbivores, which is why I want people to stop eating parrot fish. And I've had this discussion with several fishermen about explaining the steps and being like, listen, I don't have, I have nothing against pirate fish. I, I, when I was younger, and I will admit this, when I was younger, I used to hunt pirate fish for my, for my grandmother yeah. when I was fishing because <laughs> that's way, I didn't like pirate fish, but she liked it and my she mother did. liked it. I have convinced my mom not to eat it. I've convinced a couple of people, but I wish that more persons would stop. And I've had, you know, tons of arguments and discussions of, but it, it's, it's just the reality of the situation. It is one of the things that I, I'm, it's really dear to me. It's one, if I can get Antigua to stop eating fried fish, that would be my legacy right there. I think it's a great I, goal because, <laughs> you know, our reefs are in trouble and we're eating the solution, which yeah. can't make yeah. sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and let, me, let me be clear, right? It's not the only thing, mm-hmm. right? So we have pollution, we have development pressures, we have climate change, whether it's, sea level rise, ocean acidification, 
coral bleaching, sea temperature rise. There's a whole host of factors affecting reef systems, right? So my view is, even if this is, this is I, I, I look at it as you have a bucket and the bucket has several holes, right? Mm-hmm. Part, the, the loss of herbivores is one of the bigger holes in the bucket, right? And often what you find is people, people gravitate very quickly towards issues that aren't necessarily having as big as an impact as the other things. So you may have heard a lot of news about the impact of sunscreens on coral reefs. Yes, actually, quite right? a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that hole isn't that big. Mm-hmm. It's a hole. I'm it's not hole. denying that we should stop it. But if you're going to ask me, do I rather people stop using sunscreen or stop eating parrotfish, I'd buy you a case of sunscreen. <laughs> Serious. I'd yeah. buy you a case. Of, because it's, the, the, the thing is, after a storm um, and the recent damage or after a bleaching event or if there's a disease, like there's one wiping through the Caribbean right now, you need the herbivores to keep back the allergies so the corals can have a chance to grow. If you don't have that, if you don't have clear waters, if you don't reduce pollution, if you don't find a way to reduce the impacts of climate change, like um, ocean acidification, warming temperatures and what's not, you know, the reefs aren't going to last. Mm-hmm. That's just the reality. So you have to do what you can. Yeah. And this is why it's so important to have people out there doing the science so that we actually know the, like, the proportional effects of our different behaviors on the reefs. Because, you know, it's easy to be like, OK, well, this is a big thing in the media because it's a it's a nice talking point the sunscreen thing or the plastics which is also a big problem but then when it comes to your dietary choices and how those are actually affecting the reefs right even though it's a bigger issue it's less talked about or people are just less willing to participate that way it's just not the post issue and 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 what i found a lot with with our local coaches we like to find ways not to take the blame Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just natural. It, this is not me pointing human, a yeah. finger. Yeah, that's just mm-hmm. human. But like I've even even speaking about the issue of catching parrotfish, and I've spoke with fishermen who said, "Oh, oh, oh something, something." Wait, listen, you were catching parrotfish when you small. They're like, "Yeah," and your grandfather was catching parrotfish. They're like, "Yeah." So I'm like, "You're thinking about 60, 70, 80 years of parrotfish catch." Yeah, and you think ten years of storms did this? Do you think that's the only mm-hmm. factor? Yeah. You know? Or when I ask them about, have you seen a reduction in the sizes of parrotfish that you've seen over time? Because you hear all the person talk about the size of parrotfish they used to get and how easy it was to get them. And then you look at what's there now. And after a while, you kind of get them. That this People start to realize, wait, 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 hold on. Mm-hmm. Hold on. Things really have changed a lot. Yes. Um, and And... Obviously, something needs to change in our part. Um, mm-hmm. And it's a lot of things. So, so. But parrotfish fish is my pet issue. It's, it's really one that's dear to me. Um, but, you know, there's still the sunscreen issue. There's still pollution. There's dredging and, you know, marine developments and all that stuff that can have effects. There's, there's... Yeah. And speaking of the development, I know, like, the wetlands are something that are always most disproportionately affected by development. I'm thinking now about the Yida Special Economic Zone, which is located in the Northeast Marine Management Area. And that that's one of the things that just like breaks my heart <laughs> all the time. Every time I hear about this thing, I just get so angry because I mean, just the level of destruction in an area that is supposed to be, you know, um, yeah. I remember saying last time, like this is not protected in the the technical sense it's supposed to be a management area but right this development all of that is gone out the window like it's not protected or managed it's just kind of a free-for-all whatever happens is going to happen and there's very little control that the actual Antiguan public has over this there's also going to be restricted access to the Antiguan public yeah mm-hmm. um and i think one, one of the things that i try and explain to persons um and again, this is, as a scientist, learning better how to communicate what we want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the topic or the issue of ecosystem services is, is one of the ways that we try and present information. So, for instance, a coral reef um, has been shown to reduce 85 to 95% of the wave energy before it hits the shores, Right? 
that's an ecosystem service that you engineers have said that you cannot engineer that because it's not just because there's a barrier it's because of the grooves and channels and the shape and how water deflects around it mm-hmm. and the connection all of this plays a part in how effective they are yeah. engineers said they're picking probably build something to 40 50 percent but they can't reach what the natural system does nature is right? the best engineer nature is the best <clears throat> and so my thing is um, if you think about mangroves, um, mangroves are one of the largest carbon reducers on the planet. So are seagrass beds. If you judge a seagrass bed and you take down a mangrove, you're contributing to climate change, right? We haven't figured out a way to scrub carbon out the air yet. So really and truly, why would you affect that, right? And so ecosystem services is the way that we try and speak about it. Um, people get worried about when they think about the impact of tsunamis. If you had a mangrove system lying in your coastline, then the impact of a tsunami on you would be greatly reduced. You move the mangrove system, I don't care how much buildings you have there, it's coming right over. Look at what happened yeah. in Japan, right? Yeah. Like you can't physically, man made structures cannot stop these systems. What can help to reduce the impact of these systems are natural systems. And so every time we destroy something, every time we remove it, and and very often what we find is that you can destroy a natural environment in a year that will take a hundred years to come back to what it was. So it's not like you can be like, oh crap, I wasn't supposed to do this here. So let me just give it a year since I did this in a year and it'll be back. Yeah. That's not how these things work. Not at all. Right? It, if you think basic, think of the average coral growth rate is six centimeters a year. So you have a coral that's five feet in length, uh, five feet in dam to 10 feet high, whatever it is, and you destroy that. Then say five centimeters a year in ideal growth for each one of them and growing and building and whatnot. Think about how long it takes to get that coral back in an ideal situation, right? It, it just, it doesn't equate. And so trying to find Talking a way to a present... Whole- somebody's whole lifetime or more like more right more way more generations yeah. <clears throat> so it's one of the ways that we try and present ecosystem issues now is in terms of the services that they provide to humans um so if i talk about uh land growth i talk about how much land-based runoff they filter how much carbon they take down how much times it allows you to be able to go to the beach and swim and not be dirty, you know, how much fish that you eat probably grew up in a mangrove system, how much birds that you see in the frigate bird lagoon or somewhere else that you see flying around have the eggs and, you know, growing in the mangrove system, how much nutrients is is being recycled in that system, Um, you know, that kind of thing. You you talk about how it then leads back to persons because very often we find maybe that's a little bit easier to understand. even the aspect of ecosystem valuation has been touted a lot. And it's a very good system, except that you can't actually show the money that these ecosystems are worth. So like a, a hectare of mangroves is worth, based on the last study I saw they did, between thirty four to 50,000 US a year in terms mm-hmm. of its services. Mm-hmm. But can I show you that money in a bank? Can I exactly. give you that money? I can't. Right. So, you know, it, it have to, it, that helps. That's another way you can talk about it. But, you know, there isn't a one-size solution that fits everybody, really, actually. Yeah. So one of the, I guess, the criticisms or the, the pushback from people who are not really of the environmental mindset is that, you know, you want to preserve these areas, but, again, they don't have any economic benefit. But then you think about it, we're a tourism-based economy. And the reason why people want to come visit these places is the natural beauty and the clear waters and all those things, which are maintained by these ecological systems. So if we're going to dig them up in order to boost our tourism product, you know, it's counterproductive in a lot of ways, but because it takes much longer for those effects to be seen, it's not obvious, I guess, at the time that you're taking the action. Exactly. And when people do see the effects is when something happens. So let's think about 2017. Hurricane Irma rips for Barbuda, right? 
absolutely devastated about Vida. And I tell people all the time, if that storm had hit Antigua, we'd have gotten off much worse. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I tell people, we have lost more of our natural, way more of our natural barriers than Barbuda has, right? Yeah. If you look, if you ever get your hand on an old map from the early 1900s and see how much mangroves they were covering, how fully um, covered most of the harbors were with seagrass beds and, and how good the water quality was and, and what's that kind of thing. And you look at things now and how many of our harbors have been dredged for the yachting sector and how, oh, yeah. how many of this. And so you have to think, well, yes, we're a tourism economy and, and this is where I, I tend to be very careful. I don't consider myself to be a tree hugger um, mm-hmm. because I do understand that, that as much as we need to protect the environment, um, humans have a right to eat, live and breed. I have a right to eat, live, and breed. You have a right to eat, live, and breed. Um, the tourism operator has a right to eat, live, and breed. And it's our main economy. I absolutely agree that we should enhance it and we should develop it. But there has to be a point at which we say, okay, no more of this, no more of that, or we need to restore this. Or if you're going to do that, then you have to do X, Y, and Z to make up for the services that you've lost and have tangible effects of doing that. Right? Because when a hurricane comes... And you've lost your shoreline protection and the multi-million dollar structure that you had has been decimated by the waves, right? Yeah. You're going to say, oh, I do wish I had that um, system along the coastline now to help to protect me, but it's not. And that's when people, and that's when as scientists, we get to say, yeah, I told you so. I told you not to trouble it. Yeah. But it doesn't help anybody at that point either. No, which is why <laughs> something like the prevention aspect of it needs to be played up. Right. Because it, it, it just, it really, you have to find a balance. Um, and I fully agree there needs to be a balance, but it's just how do we best um, establish that balance? And I'm not a policymaker. I have more vested in protecting the natural environment. Um, so I know I'm probably slightly biased, but I also know that I probably understand it a bit more than the average person. Mm-hmm. And so because of that, I probably know how bad we are. Yeah. Well, you're an expert, right? This is your field of expertise. And you're biased, like your bias is opposite of the natural cultural bias, which is to, you know, consume the parrot fish or build more hotels disregard kind of the wetlands there's also the the problem of illegal dumping in mangrove areas yep people thinking that mangroves are just swampy disgusting things smelly areas that breed mosquitoes and i actually had a a conversation with a a youth group uh, on the primary schools i was like when you think of a mangrove swamp what do you think of it was it smells bad somewhere to put your rubbish oh my god mosquitoes your rubbish yeah these were, none of them were over 10. Oh my goodness. And I was just like, I can't be angry at them. Yeah. They're just going based on what they've seen and heard, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, uh, it, it's kind of an explanation that, you know, in its natural healthy state, mangrove ecosystem doesn't smell. It doesn't breed mosquitoes because it, it's a salty system. Mm-hmm. And what salt water can't, mosquito lava can't survive in salt water. So it doesn't breed mosquitoes. So there's no smell. It doesn't do that. It's interconnected. There shouldn't be any garbage in there. It filters our pollution. So when you think about if you clear a landscape and put concrete, you increase the water runoff of the area. That water then runs past, let's say, a farm or a dump site or something. It's full of nutrients. Mangrove system is what filters that before it goes into the sea. Where if it's in the sea, especially if you think about, okay, yeah, best case scenario, downwind of Cook's Dump is one of the largest and least managed mango system. Nobody pays attention to it because it's mm-hmm. downwind of Cook's Dump. Nobody wants to do anything yes. down there because it's downwind of Cook's Dump and it smells mm-hmm. bad. If that mango system wasn't there, Five Islands Harbor would be the nastiest place on this earth. <laughs> on the earth? Yeah. No, because when you think about it, that system is filtering so much because every time there's massive rain and water runs, it runs into that wetland system and that filters it out before it gets into the ocean or filters out most of it before it gets into the ocean. And you feel like if someone asks you, would I rather swim in Five Islands Arbor 
or deep water harbor below St. John's, it's going to be five hours harbor. Yeah. Why? Because there's a mangrove system above it. If St. John's harbor was lined by a large mangrove system, it wouldn't be the way it was today. Mm-hmm. In that explanation, you kind of alluded to the connection between the mangrove areas and the coral systems, because you're talking about how the, the mangroves help to yeah. filter out the pollution and any extra nutrients before they can get out to the sea and actually affect uh, the larger system, which is really interesting. I don't know if I've really ever heard those two things connected that way. Okay, so, so there's, a third, there's a third piece of that puzzle mm-hmm. that is very important. Um, and that's seagrass beds, right? Yeah. Um, and it's weird because I actually gave a talk the other day um, talking about what, what I like to call the Holy Trinity. So the Holy Trinity is mangrove wetlands, seagrass beds, and coral reef ecosystems, right? And right. these are ecosystems that, as you're rightly saying right now, we normally think of them in isolation. Mm-hmm. We normally think mangrove wetlands are there, seagrass beds are there, and coral reefs are all there. They actually are very, very much interlinked, um, from both directions. So if you go from the land, right? Um, mangroves are your primary land filtration system of any nutrients, any runoff, any pollution, anything coming off, this, off the land. The first barrier to it is a mangrove system, right? Mm, yeah. Um, then after that, you have seagrass beds. The seagrass is a plant so it can deal with higher amounts of nutrients. Mm-hmm. So if there'll be still some chemical nutrients that gets from mangrove systems, right? Typically, so you ask the mangrove system, you have seagrass beds. And so they, they do a double factor, really. Any kind of sedimentation that gets through the mangrove system, seagrass beds actually reduce the, the energy, the flow of the water. And so it allows a lot of the sedimentation to, to sink. So sedimentation being like soil or... Sand. Yeah, soil matter, yeah. soil parts, whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so if you think about like after, especially like a big rainfall, and you have a lot of surface runoff, and you see the mm-hmm. harvest kind of brown from all the dirt that got washed into it. Yeah. Seagrass beds help to slow that down and help to pull a lot of that out, right? So you have mangroves doing initial filtration, stopping a lot of the big waste and quite a bit of the chemical waste also because these mangrove roots will then take up a lot of these nutrients. Whatever gets through then goes to the seagrass bed. So normally by the time you get to the coral reefs, you have very clear, clean waters, right? Right. From the other side, coral reefs tend to break down a lot of the wave energy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because seagrass beds and mangroves don't like a lot of wave energy. So, so uh-huh. scories do the first breakdown of the wave energy. Seagrass beds increase because, again, they slow down the energy in the movement of water. So they reduce that more, which allow mangroves to thrive and grow healthily. From an, eco- from an ecological or from a um, biodiversity perspective, um, mangroves provide a lot of habitat, not just for birds and crustaceans, mm-hmm. <clears throat> but they also provide what I like to call it in the nursery system of a marine ecosystem. So especially when you think about red mangroves, um, they have what's called proc roots. They almost look like they're walking on stilts. Yes. These extend in the water. And it basically, it's a nursery area for a lot of juvenile fish. So snappers, groupers, grunts, you name it, you can find a lot of juvenile fish. And a lot of the big fish will come in and have their eggs in the mangrove system and then leave because my, most fish are bad parents. They don't take care of the young. They drop <laughs> off the eggs and swim off and go to luck, have fun. I may come back in and try and eat you later. But <laughs> what happened because of these root system, the juvenile fish can hide among the roots and tend to be protected from predators. So that's why they're nursery. Right? Yeah. Then from the nursery, they go to primary school slash early secondary school, which is the seagrass beds. Because there, they tend to be a little bit bigger. They can hide among the seagrass a bit, but they're hunting a bit more. It's a different type of ecosystem. They're, they're a bit more exposed. Some fish species never leave seagrass beds. Some only ever get as far as seagrass beds. But, but the point is, it's almost like the second stage yeah. before they're big enough, quote unquote, big enough to go onto a, a coral reef system, right? Mm-hmm. And then once you have a healthy coral reef system, you get healthy fish, which is then able to come back in and, you know, Go back to like the mangroves and lay more eggs. And so you get this rotation interconnectivity between. And I think that's one of the things that's also missing in Antigua is that 
we have, even in our management efforts, we have managed too often in isolation and not looking at the interconnectivity of these systems. So you're protecting mangroves or you're saying, for instance, one of, the, one of the things that we want is to improve the health of our coral reef ecosystem. So we are saying that we want to bring back coral reef health, we want more live corals, etc. But we're not taking into account how much seagrass beds have been lost or have a lower health potential, how much mangrove wetlands have been lost or lower health potential. So we want the reefs to look like what they used to look like 100 years ago but we're not trying to get the seagrass beds or the mangrove system back to what they looked like a hundred years ago. Right. That doesn't work. It, 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 the systems are too interconnected for you to expect that you're going to get this one back to this level without, without also others. bringing these ones back up. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually one of the things I'm trying to do a little bit more studying and investigating into really understanding the fact of that dynamic. And, and how does it affect management goals? So, you know, are we realistic in saying that we want X or given what we have, we can only get Z? And we have to be honest about what we can get. Otherwise, we're failing on every step. And, you know, it looks like we're not doing a decent job. But if we can at least get Z, then you can maybe see how you can work, you know, backwards. You know, whatever the case is. But mm -hmm. it, it really doesn't work to, to, to manage in isolation. No, it really doesn't. And the other thing too is like us as humans, as people, as our separate society, thinking of ourselves as separate from the natural world. Right. Like we're part of the system. So the behaviors that we exhibit, even though it might be on land, even though you're not doing what you're doing inside, you know, the wetlands themselves, it still right. has an impact. Right. Yes. And there's, there's this knock on effect and, you know, and another big thing that people like to say is that the ocean is, is it, it's too big, it's too vast. There's no way that what I'm doing can have an effect. And it's, it's a concept we really need to change. And, and you'd think it doesn't exist anymore, except I've spoken to persons, not this year, but last year, who have made that statement to me. Oh, it's just, it's the ocean, man. It don't matter. It can yeah. be with it. <laughs> the thing and is, we used to think that way about it. land, too. Until... Yeah. All the people, countries, humans filled up all the land and now mm -hmm. we're like, oh, there's no more. Right. But, but the ocean is a lot harder to, to visualize because you can't see it. Yeah. And a lot of the ecosystems are locked into specific areas where they can live. So like coral reefs can't live in high areas. Mm -hmm. So you'd never, you won't find coral reefs off of, you know, either high polluted areas or places like where you have high nutrient waters. Right. So you won't find reefs there. But in the same way they also can't live below a certain depth so once you get mm -hmm. below a certain depth then you won't find the same kind of coral reef systems because they need sunlight for the phytoplankton yes. to produce food so, you know you get all these different limitations and people don't see the ocean in that kind of stratified manner they just see it as if it's here it can be there well, I'm really happy that you and, you know, your colleagues are out there doing this work and also helping to educate the public about the impact that we can be having as individuals on these systems. And also just bringing more awareness to how interconnected everything is. I think it's really important work. And I applaud you for being so passionate about it. Well, I, I, I thank you for that. But I, I do have to give you some credit too, because again, I'm not the best communicator. So you providing me a medium to talk about this is a way of me getting my information out. And for that, you know, thank you for putting on a platform where I can speak like this openly about thoughts and feelings and, you know, where do I think things are going and what can be done? Yeah, I appreciate that. And so in closing, I'd like you to share your social media information so that if anyone's listening to this and wants to follow along with any of your pages and see what you're posting and what you're up to, they can get online and do that. Marine Ecology 268 um, is my Instagram page right now. And also, if, if anyone ever has any questions or would like me to like come and give a talk or have a conversation, um, you can always reach me by email. It's u-l-e-o dot c-a-m-a-c-h-o I'm always more than willing to 
talk about something if I know about it. If it's something environmentally related and I don't know, I'm either A, probably might know someone who can speak about it. Mm -hmm. Or if I have the time, I can research it a bit and give you an overview. So um, I'm always willing to spread information where I can, um, when I can, if I can. Great. I know this talk is going to be really um, educational or helpful for people who are interested in this kind of thing. So all the best. All right. Thanks. You too. Thank you for listening to this episode of Grassroots Radio. If you enjoyed the conversation, show some love and help spread the word. You can do that by subscribing on Apple, Google, YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Already subscribed? Consider leaving a five-star review. It helps other people find the show. If you have an idea for someone you want to see featured or a topic you want us to cover, let us know. DM us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at grassrootsanu or email us at thenewgrassroots at gmail.com. For more about NGR, visit us at thenewgrassroots.com. Until next time, this is... Grassroots Radio.